back, everybody. Me and old Noodle here again. You want to tell them what we're going to get into today, Noodle? Huh? Huh? Yeah, we're going to do a, we're going to do another episode of Badasses. And this is Badasses episode two right now. Okay? Stay tuned. Got some interesting stuff going on here. All right? Tell them, Noodle. Stay tuned. Got some cool stuff coming up. Right? Because you're a badass, ain't you? Huh? Yeah, look at you trying to do a somersault off my shoulder. <laughs> yes, yeah, psycho. Anyways, okay. Everybody, we're going to go ahead. We'll get started. We're going to get started with the first set of thing here. Okay. First one we're going to talk about on Badasses Episode 2 right now is a man by the name of Jack Hansen. He's in uh, 7th Infantry Division, uh, Bayonet Division. Um, Jack Glennon Han no, maybe not, I, I think, yeah, that was what it was. Uh, Jack Glennon Hansen, uh, born September 18th, 1930, and lived between June, to Ju till June 7th, 1951. Excuse me. He was a soldier in the United States Army during the Korean War. He posthumously, 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 received the Medal of Honor for his actions on June 7, 1951, during which he saved the members of his squad born, born, yeah, well, I already said he was, when he was born on 18th, September 18th, 1930, but that was in Ascotop, Ascotop, Mississippi. What are you doing down there? Stop it. Sorry, guys. He's being a distraction. He's, he's hurt. He's, Wanting to bite the heck out of me. You better stop being so daggone mean, goofball. Anyways, where was I at here? Oh, in Ascotop, es es Ascotopa, Mississippi. Sorry, you guys, if I misspelled it. Let me know if I mispronounced it, whatever. Um, okay, and he died June 7th, 1950. He was aged 20 years old, y'all. He was 20 years old when he died. Short life lived, man. Anyways, um, that was near Pakidong, Korea. Place of burial was Robinson Cemetery in es Escatapa, Mississippi. Um, his rank was Private First Class. The unit he was in was Company F, 31st Infantry Regiment, 7th Infantry. Um, 7th Infantry Division, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> battles he was in was the Korean War. All right. His awards, Medal of Honor, he got the Purple Heart as well. Uh, Medal of Honor Citation. Uh, the rank and organization, uh, Private First Class, U.S. Army Company F, 31st Infantry Regiment, 7th Infantry Division, place and date near Pakidong, Korea, June 7th, 1951. Entered service at Galveston, Texas. Born September 18th, 1930, Escatapa, Mississippi. Citation. And now I'm going to go ahead and read the citation here for you, okay? Private First Class Hansen, a machine gunner with the 1st Platoon, Company F, distinguished himself with conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty in action against an armed enemy of the United Nations. The company in defensive positions on two strategic hills separated by a wide saddle was ruthlessly attacked at approximately 0300 hours, the brunt of which centered on the approach to the divide within range of Private First Class Hansen's machine gun. In the initial phase of the action, four riflemen were wounded and evacuated and, and the numerically superior enemy advancing under cover of darkness infiltrated and posed an imminent threat to the security of the command post and weapons platoon. Upon orders to move to key terrain above and to the right of Private First Class Hansen's position, he voluntarily remained to provide protective fire for the withdrawal. Subsequent to the retiring elements fighting a rear guard action to the new location, it was learned that Private First Class Hansen's assistant gunner and three riflemen had been wounded and had crawled to safety and that he was maintaining a lone man a, a lone man defense 
After the first platoon reorganized, counterattacked, and re resecured its original positions at approximately 0530 hours, uh, PFC Hansen's body was found lying in front of his emplacement, his machine gun ammunition expended, his empty pistol in his right hand, and a machete with blood on the blade in his left hand. And approximately 22 enemy dead lay in the wake of his action. Private First Class Hansen's consummate valor, inspirational conduct, and willing self-sacrifice enabled the company to contain the enemy and regain the commanding ground and reflect lasting glory on himself and the noble traditions of the military service. Wow, you guys, that's crazy. That's just... I'm sorry that that's all that I had on that, you know, uh, as far as what I, I, I feel bad that that's all I got, but that's just what they, that's what I got from where I searched, you know, and it, it's, but we're going to go, it's okay, though, because we got two more we're going to do, okay, so let's go ahead and go through it, because we don't make it too, too long for you guys, I don't want you guys getting bored on me now, um, trust me, these stories are good, they, they're, well, I don't want to call them stories, uh, well, I don't know what, I don't know what you call them, man. These true events. True events. Okay? Give me one second. All right, everybody. Now we're going to talk about the second guy on here. His name is a Mr. Hewitt Dunn. All right? Now, this fella was, uh, was a pilot. All right? I'll just give you that. First off, before we start with the information. Now, we're going to go ahead and go down to the, the facts and stuff like that. The 390th Strategic Missile Wing was an intercontinental ballistic missile organization of the United States Air Force. Part of Strat Strategic Air Command, it was stationed at Davis Monthan Air, ba Air Force Base in Arizona, active between 1943 to 1945. And then re then activated again 1962 to 1984. Now the, in the country it was in is the United States, the branch United States Air Force. Uh, the role it played was long range missile, uh, part of Strategic Air Command, and the motto was Sur les Nez in French. On the nose, World War II. That's what that translates to. And then non nobis solum in Latin. Not for ourselves alone, SAC. The mascot was a honey bear in World War II. Engagements, uh, European Theater of Operations. Then decorations is distinguished unit citation is what he got in the Air Force Outstanding Unit Award. World War II, uh, tail marking on the plane was a square J. Square, it says square J. Now, whether it's a square and a J, I don't know. It just said square and Jay, so I, I didn't see the symbol itself, y'all. Okay, I'm sorry, but I, that's what I got. Um, the wing was first organized as the 319th or 390th, sorry, pardon me, 390th Bombardment Group in January 1943 and equipped with the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress. After training in the United States, the group moved to England, beginning combat operations in August. The group flew 300 combat missions and was twice awarded the Distinguished Unit Citation for its action in combat. That says a lot right there. Um, its last mission was on April 20th, 1945. Now, after VE Day, the group returned to the United States where it was inactivated in August 1945. The 390th Strategic Missile Wing was organized in January of 1962 as the United States Air Force's first LGM 25C Titan II wing, becoming operational in March 1963. Um, it earned honors as the best Titan II wing in Strategic Air Command on five occasions. Okay, you go, man. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and in 1979, earned the Blanchard Trophy as SAC's best missile wing of any kind. It was inactivated in 1984 with the retirement of the Titan II from the United States Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Inventory. 
Just before the wing was inactivated, the Air Force consolidated the group and the wing into a single unit. Oh, okay. Now, World War II. Now, we're going to go back to World War II with uh, Mr. Uh, William Hewitt Dunn, okay? Uh, now, his, train, the training, his training in the U.S., okay? The unit was first activated on January 26, 1943 at Geiger Field, Washington, as the 390th Bombardment Group with the 568th, 569th, 570th, and 571st Bombardment Squadrons. The group did not begin to fill its ranks until early the following month. The group trained at Geiger until June 1943 when it moved to Great Falls Army Air Base in Montana. Now, senior officers of the group were the first from, from bombardment groups to be assigned to 8th Air Force to attend the Army Air Force's School of Applied Tactics at Orlando Army Air Base in Florida, where comprehensive training based on the Army Air Force's combat experience was conducted. The 390th Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress began their flights overseas on July 4th, taking the northern ferry route from Iceland to Prestwick Airport, Scotland where the first aircraft arrived on July 13, 1943. The ground echelon left to Camp Shank, Shanks, New, uh, New York the same day and sailed on the SS James Parker on July 17, 1943 and arrived at Liverpool on July 27th. Uh, the group was reunited at its permanent station, RAF Framlingham, a few days later. Now, combat in Europe. Let's get into it, you guys. The group was the last of the second wing, or second wind, heavy bombardment groups that reinforced 8 Bomber Command in the 8 Bomber Command in the summer of 1943 to arrive in England. I'm sorry, it didn't make sense to me. I couldn't put it together. I'm just having a brain fart, you guys. Uh, it operated chiefly against strategic objectives. Okay, now the 390th began combat on August 12, 1943. Only five days later, on August 17th, the group attacked the Messerschmitt Aircraft Complex at Regensburg, achieving the highest accuracy of any of the groups sent against the target. Near the target area, the group was attacked by twin-engine German fighters and suffered the heaviest losses of the three groups in the lead wing. This was a shuttle mission, with the bombers recovering at 12th Air Force bases in North Africa, although a group aircraft was one of the first two American planes to make emergency landings in neutral Switzerland. Switzerland. The, group the group received a Distinguished Unit Citation for the mission. The 390th was awarded a second Distinguished Unit Citation for a mission on October 14, 1943, when it braved assaults by enemy fighters to bomb the ball-bearing plants at Schweinfurt. Once again, the group had the most accurate bombing results of the units attacking the target. Allied intelligence estimated that following the attack, German ball-bearing production was reduced by 50%, that it was six months before production was restored to its level before the attack. So they set them back a little bit, you know what I mean? Just from that one attack, that's crazy. I mean, when you you don't think about this stuff because you don't really, we just, we don't think about that stuff. Um, okay, but the group participated in the intensive Allied attacks on the German aircraft industry during big week uh, from 20, the 20th to 25th of, of February, 1944 when it bombed aircraft factories, instrument plants, and aircraft depots. Other strategic missions included attacks on uh, marshalling yards at Frankfurt, bridges at Cologne, petroleum facilities at Zeitz, 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 factories at Mannheim, naval installations at Bremen, and synthetic oil refineries at Merseburg. In January 1944, Sergeant Hewitt Buck Dunn joined the 390th who was a gunner and bombarder. He bombardier. He went on to become the only man in the in the Eighth Air Force to fly over 100 combat missions and one of the most decorated enlisted men. Wow, you guys, talk about a badass, huh? Uh, in the U.S. in the U.S. Air Force, 
He died in 1961 at the age of 41 and is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. The group was sometimes diverted from the strategic mission to fly interdiction and ground support missions. On May 25, 1944, a detachment of the group was directed to bomb coastal defenses in France using radar, despite weather conditions that were ideal for visual bombing. Although crew members were not advised why radar bombing was directed, this mission was a test to determine if Pathfinder operations would succeed if the weather over Normandy was foul when the invasion took place. Thereafter, the group uh, the group would frequently use Pathfinder techniques when clouds obscured its, its assigned targets. The group bombed the coast near uh, Seine 15 minutes before the D-Day landings in Normandy on June 6, 1944. It attacked enemy artillery in, in support of ground forces during Operation Cobra. The breakout at St. Lowe in late July 40, 1944. In August of 1944, the group attacked a Folk Wolf, a Falk Wolf aircraft factory at Rumia, or Rommel, Poland, landing at Mergorod in the Ukraine. After flying a mission against the synthetic oil production facility at Trzebinia, Poland, uh, returning to Mergorod, Mergorod or whatever, the, the group attacked airfields in Romania, landing in Italy. On its return to Feltwell, the group attacked a French airfield, suffering no losses to the three-legged mission. The 390th cut German supply lines during the Battle of the Bulge between December 1944 and January 1945. On January 14, 1945, during an attack on targets near Berlin, a low squadron of the group's aircraft were separated from the main attack, uh, main attack formation because of supercharger problems with the lead aircraft, making them easy targets for German fighters, which shot down all eight flying fortresses in the formation. This was the highest loss the 390th suffered on a single mission during the war. The group attacked airfields of the Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe to support Operation Varsity, the airborne assault across the Rhine in March 1945, on April 5, 1945, Master Sergeant Hewitt, Hewitt Dunn became the only person to fly 100 combat missions with the 8th Air Force. The 390th Bombardment Group flew its last combat mission on April 20, 1945. In over 300 missions, they dropped more than 19,000 tons of bombs. Holy shit, you all. Step back and think of that. The, the weight. Okay? Wow. That's a lot. Uh, in my opinion, that's a lot. I mean, maybe I'm just a dumbass. And maybe it's nothing compared to what, But that's a lot to me. Uh, they lost 176 aircraft and 714 airmen were killed in action. Yeah, sorry to hear that, man. That's There's a lot of loss. A lot of loss that happened throughout all this. Um, the unit claimed the destruction of 342 enemy aircraft. The group dropped food supplies, food, food supplies to the Dutch during the week prior to VE Day. The 390th redeployed to the States between June and August of 1945. The unit's aircraft left from Framlingham on June 25th and 26th of 1945. The ground echelon sailed from Green, Greenock. Greenock on the RMS Queen Elizabeth on August 5, 1945, and arrived in New York on August 11th, and its members were granted leave. The group moved at a minimum strength to Sioux Falls Army Airfield, South Dakota, on August 12th, and was inactivated there on August 28, 1945. Oh, man, these, these guys are tough, man. They're tough, tough birds, man. Tough birds. Give me one second. We'll get to the next one. All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and go with this is going to be the last the last uh, person on the Badasses Episode 2, all right? I wanted to combine a few of them because, I, like I said, the first one, it was a little short on the notes. Excuse me. The second one had a little bit, but it wasn't, wasn't too full. Maybe I could have done more research, but honestly, I don't have, I don't get that, that much time like a lot of these other people that do content because I do have a, I have a 
full-time job. Normally, you know, I don't do the, I don't do just like just this. You know, if I did, I'd, I'd be able to get into it a little bit deeper for you guys, you know, and I'm, I apologize for that. But, I mean, my restraints are my restraints, if you know what I mean. Um, but anyways, this is going to be Carlos Hatchcock we're going to talk about. He was a Marine sniper. All right. Now, Carlos Norman Hatchcock II was born May 20th, 1942 and uh, survived until February 22nd, 1999. He was a United States Marine Corps USMC sniper with a service record of 93 confirmed kills. Hatchcock's record and the extra extraordinary details of the missions he undertook made him a legend in the U U.S. Marine Corps. He was honored by having a rifle named after him, a variant of the M21 dubbed the Springfield Armory M25 White Feather, for the nickname White Feather, given to Hatchcock by the North Vietnamese People's Army of Vietnam. Now, I want to tell you that's P-A-V-N is the initial. So when I say, if I say P-A-V-N because I did abbreviate it throughout the notes, I don't want you being confused. That's the North Vietnamese People's Army. Okay, People's Army of Vietnam. That's what P-A-V-N is. People's Army of Vietnam. Just so we're all clear. Okay, his birth name was Carlos Norman Hatchcock II. His nickname was White Feather. He was born May 20th, 1942, as we said, in Little Rock, Arkansas, U.S. He died February 22nd, 1999, at age 56 in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Um, he was buried in Woodlawn Memorial Gardens in Norfolk, Virginia. He served in the United States in the branch of the United States Marine Corps. Years of service, 1959 to 1979. His rank was gunnery sergeant. His unit was 1st Marine Division. The battles and wars he fought in was Vietnam. His awards was the Silver Star, the Navy Commendation Medal, Purple Heart, and uh, that, that's just to name some. Um, we'll probably go through that a little later, okay? Uh, but his spouse was Josephine Bryan, or Nee Broughton Hatchcock. They married in 1962. He had he had children. They had children, and the child's name was Carlos Norman Hatchcock III. Okay, now we're going to talk about their early life and education. Hatchcock was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, on May twentieth, nineteen forty-two, to parents Carlos Norman Hatchcock I, nineteen nineteen to nineteen eighty-five, and May Thompson, nineteen twenty to nineteen eighty-nine. That was their lifespan. Okay, in case you're confused, he grew up in Winnie, Arkansas. Wynn, Arkansas, living with his grandmother, Myrtle, uh, lifespan 1900 to 2000, for the first 12 years of his life after his parents separated. Uh, while visiting relatives in Mississippi, he took to shooting and hunting at an early age, um, partly out of necessity to help feed his poor family. He would go into the woods with his dog and pretend to be a soldier and hunt imaginary Japanese soldiers with the German Mauser which his father, a veteran of two wars, brought brought back from World War II. He hunted at that early age with a 22 caliber J.C. Higgins single-shot rifle. Hatchcock dreamed of, of being a Marine throughout his childhood, and so on, and so on. May 20th, 1959, his 17th birthday, he enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Hatchcock married Josephine Joe Bryant, knee Broughton, uh, 1930 to 2016. I don't know. Uh, on the date of the on the date of the Marine Corps Corps birthday, November 10th, 1962, Joe gave birth to a son whom they named Carlos Norman Hatchcock III. Now we're going to go into the career. The career says before deploying to South Vietnam, Hatchcock had won shooting championships, including matches at Camp Perry and the Wimbledon Cup. Wimbledon Cup. What? In 1966, Hatchcock started his deployment in the Vietnam War as a military policeman and later became a sniper. Captain Edward James Land pushed the Marines into raising snipers in every platoon. Uh, Land later recruited Marines who had set their own records in sharpshooting. He quickly found Hatchcock, who had won the Wimbledon Cup, the most prestigious prize for long-range shooting at Camp Perry in 1965. 
confirmed kills. Now we're going to go into those. During the Vietnam War, Hatchcock had 93 confirmed kills of People's Army of Vietnam, or PAVM, and Viet Cong personnel. In the Vietnam War, kills had to be confirmed by the sniper, spotter, and a third party, who had to be an officer. Snipers often did not have a third party present, making confirmation difficult, especially if the target was behind enemy lines, as was usually the case. Makes a lot of sense. Okay. Now, Hatchcock himself estimated that he had killed between 300 and 400 enemy personnel during the Vietnam War. Now, confrontations with the North Vietnamese snipers. The PAVN, or the People's Army of Vietnam, uh, I, I, I can't remember what the heck it was. It was, you know, People's Army of Vietnam placed a bounty of the U.S. of US $30,000 on Hatchcock's life for killing so many of its soldiers. Rewards put on U.S. snipers by the PAVN typically range from $8 to $2,000. So that, that gives you a scale as to how bad they wanted him dead. You understand? that? I mean, that's crazy. $30,000 on his head, and generally they'd put on $8 to $2,000. Now, Hatchcock held the record for the highest bounty and killed every known Vietnamese marksman who sought him to try to collect it. The Viet Cong and P PAVN called Hatchcock Long Tran, Trang, translated as White Feather. Because of the White Feather, he kept in a band on his bush hat. After a platoon of Vietnamese snipers was set to hunt down White Feather, many Marines in the same area donned White Feathers to deceive the enemy. These Marines were aware of the impact Hatchcock's death would have and, it, and took it upon themselves to make themselves targets in order to confuse the counter snipers. One of Hatchcock's most famous accomplishments was shooting an enemy sniper through the enemy's own rifle scope, hitting him in the eye and killing him. Now that's one hell of a shot, you guys. Period. That's Hatchcock and John Roland Burke his spotter, were stalking the enemy sniper in the jungle near Hill 55, the fire base from which Hatchcock was operating southwest of Da Nang. The sniper, known only as the Cobra, had already killed several Marines and was believed to have been sent specifically to kill Hatchcock. When Hatchcock saw a glint, light reflecting off the enemy sniper's scope in the bushes, he fired at it, shooting through the scope and killing the sniper. Hatchcock took possession of the dead sniper's rifle, hoping to bring it home as a trophy. But after he turned it in and tagged it, it was stolen from the armory. Ain't that, ain't that a bitch. Okay, Hatchcock stated in interviews that he killed a female Viet Cong platoon leader called the Apache Woman with a reputation for torturing captive U.S. Marines around the firebase at Hill 55. However, scholars such as Jerry Lemke have cast doubt on Hatchcock's account and questioned the existence of Apache. Hatchcock only once removed the white feather from his bush hat while deployed in Vietnam. Uh, oh, yeah, Hatchcock only once removed the white feather from his bush hat while, while deployed in Vietnam. During a volunteer mission, days before the end of his first deployment, he crawled over 1,500 yards of field to shoot a PAVN general. Let's take a second for that one, okay? I, I just want to get this. I want this to sink into your head, okay? 1,500 yards. 1,500 yards, okay? That's a long distance they had to crawl over. And you got to understand, it's not like you're doing like a jog, a walk, anything like no. Homeboy's crawling in the he's crawling in the in the grass and the you know trying to evade enemy patrols and whatever to get to his target. Period. This it probably took days. I don't I would think that's maybe a day or two. I don't know. Uh let's see what it says here. Well yeah it just uh, it does say it. I, you know he was not informed of the details of, of the mission until he accepted it. This effort took four days and three nights without sleep and with constant inch-by-inch inch crawling. 
Okay, I thought it said that about it in there. Uh, Hatchcock said he was almost he he was almost stepped on as he lay camouflaged with grass and vegetation in a meadow shortly after sunset. At one point, he was nearly bitten by a bamboo viper, but had the presence of mind to avoid moving and giving up his position. As the general exited his encampment, Hatchcock fired a single shot that struck the general in the chest, killing him. After the mission, Hatchcock returned to the United States in 1967. He missed the Marine, he missed the Marine Corps, however, and returned to Vietnam in 1969, two years later, where he took command of a platoon of snipers. Wow, this dude, he, he was itching to get back into the into the fight, I guess, huh? Um, now, medical evacuation, we're going to talk about that. On September 16, 1969, Hatchcock's career as a sniper came to a sudden end along, along Highway 1, north of Landing Zone Baldy, when the LVP, LVTP-5 he was riding on struck an anti-tank mine. Hatchcock pulled seven Marines from the flame-engulfed vehicle, suffering severe burns, some third degree, to his face, arms, and legs before someone pulled him away and placed him in water because he was unaware of how badly he was burnt. Wow, his adrenaline was his adrenaline was peaked up, you guys. It had to be for him to, you know, that's crazy. All right, let's continue on. While recovering, Hatchcock received the Purple Heart Nearly 30 years later, he received a silver star for this action. Hatchcock and the seven Marines he pulled from the vehicle were evacuated by helicopter to hospital ship USS Repose, then to a naval hospital in Tokyo, and ultimately to the burn center at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas. Now, post-Vietnam War and health decline. We're going to talk about that next, okay? After returning to active duty, Hatchcock helped establish the Marine Corps Scout Sniper School at the Marine Base in Quantico, Virginia. Due to the extreme injuries he suffered in Vietnam, he was, nearly con in co he was in nearly constant pain, but he continued to dedicate himself to teaching snipers. In 1975, Hatchcock's health began to deteriorate, and he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. He stayed in the Marine Corps, but his health continued to decline. Just 55 days short of the 20 years that would have made him eligible for regular retirement pay, he received a permanent disability separation. Oh, man. I don't know if that's good or bad, to be honest with you. I don't know. I mean, it's of course, it's bad being taken out disability, you know. Um, being medically discharged, he received 100% disability pay. What? I didn't think they did. Uh, he would have received only 50% of his final pay grade had he retired after 20 years. Wow, y'all. That's news to me. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, he fell into a state of depression when he was forced out of the Marines because, of, because he felt as if the service had kicked him out. During this depression, his wife Jo nearly left him but decided to stay. Hatchcock eventually picked up the, the hobby of shark fishing, which helped him to overcome his depression. Hatchcock provided sniper instruction to police departments and select military units, such as SEAL Team 6. That's crazy, you guys. Okay, let's stop just one second. I just want to put a note on this, okay? Speaking about depression. All right. You know, if if, if, if you know you're, you're having depression and stuff like that, there's... there's uh, numbers you can call, uh, depression lines and stuff like that. You know, talk to somebody. You know, don't don't let that stuff fester because it's it, it could it could end up bad. You don't want that. Okay, um, I'm just saying. That, you know, because I think in the end we all have a little bit of we all go through a little bit of depression at some point or another. You know, but you know these guys they're they're risking their lives. You know on a daily all right i mean it's 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 the amount of of stuff that weighs on their minds you know it's it's a lot i could imagine so you know when you see a veteran when you see anybody of military um military status of any kind 
thank them for their service. I, 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 I recommend that. It means a lot to them. It, and, and, and you should be, you should be happy to eat, to just stand up and tell them that because we all need to be thankful. We got what we got because of people like that. So, uh, let's continue on. Uh, later life and death. Hatchcock once said that, that he in his work, that in his, Oh, crap. That doesn't even make no sense. Maybe I was tired when I wrote that. I don't know. I'm sorry, you guys, but I'm trying to decide for my own notes. That's crazy. Hatchcock once said that he, in his work, because of an ability to get in the bubble, oh, that he probably excelled in his work because he, he was able to get in the bubble. I must have missed a word there. I'm sorry. I was probably tired the other night. Uh, an ability to get in the bubble, to put himself into a state of utter complete absolute concentration first with his equipment then his environment around him in which every breeze and every leaf meant something and finally on his quarry after the war a friend showed Hatchcock a passage written by Ernest Hemingway and this is the passage he showed him excuse me certainly there is no hunting like the hunting of a man hunting of man and those who have hunted armed men long enough and like it never really care for anything else thereafter. He copied Hemingway's words on a piece of paper. He got that right, Hatchcock said. It was the hunt, not the killing. Hatchcock said in a book written about his career as a sniper, I like shooting and I love hunting, but I never did enjoy killing anybody. It's my job. If I don't get those bastards then they're going to kill a lot of these kids dressed up like Marines. That's the way I look at it. Hatchcock's son, Carlos Hatchcock III, later enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps. He retired from the Marine Corps as a gunnery sergeant after following in his father's footsteps as a shooter and became a member of the Board of Governors of the Marine Corps' Distinguished Shooters Association. Whoa, you guys. Man. Hatchcock died on February 22, 1999 in Virginia Beach, Virginia, aged 56 from complications resulting from multiple sclerosis. He is buried at Woodlawn Memorial Gardens in Norfolk, Virginia. And Hatchcock's awards include the Silver Star, the Purple Heart, the Navy Commendation Medal, the Navy Achievement Medal with, with the V device, uh, Combat Action Ribbon, Navy and Marine Corps Presidential Unit Citation with one service star. Marine Corps Good Conduct Medal with one silver, one silver, which is uh, a, one silver star, which is five awards. National Defense Service Medal, Vietnam, Sur Vietnam Service Medal with four campaign stars. Vietnam Gallantry Cross with gold star. Vietnam Gallantry Cross with palm and frame, Vietnam Civil Actions Medal with palm and frame, Vietnam Campaign Medal with 1960 device, Marine Corps Rifle Expert Marksman Badge, and Marine Corps Pistol Expert Marksman's Badge. Uh, the citation. Let's go ahead and go through this. We're going to read through this. This is what the citation says, okay? The President of the United States of America takes pleasure in presenting the Silver Star to Staff Sergeant Carlos N. Hatchcock, the second, MCSN 1873109, United States Marine Corps for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action, in action while serving as a sniper, 7th Marines, 1st Marine Division in connection with military operations against the enemy in the Republic of Vietnam on, on September 16, 1969. Staff Sergeant Hatchcock was riding on an assault amphibious vehicle which ran over and detonated an enemy anti-tank mine, disabling the vehicle which was immediately engulfed in flames. He and other Marines who were riding on top of the vehicle were sprayed with flames, flaming gasoline caused by the explosion. Although suffering from severe burns to his face, trunk, arms, and legs, Staff Sergeant Hatchcock assisted the injured Marines in exiting the burning vehicle and moving to a place of relative safety. With complete disregard for his own safety and while suffering excruciating pain from his burns, 
he bravely ran back through the flames and exploding ammunition to ensure that no Marines had been left behind in the burning vehicle. His heroic actions were instrumental in saving the lives of several Marines. By his courage, aggressive leadership, and total devotion to duty in the face of extreme personal danger, Staff Sergeant Hatchcock reflected great credit upon himself and the Marine Corps and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. And that was the citation, you guys. Now, we're going to talk about his legacy. Hatchcock remains a legend in the United U.S. Marine Corps. The Gunnery Sergeant Carlos Hatchcock Award is presented annually by the National Defense Industrial uh, Association to recognize an individual who has made significant contributions in operational employment and tactics of small arms weapon systems which have impacted the readiness and capabilities of the U.S. military or law enforcement. The Marine Corps League, or MCL, sponsors an annual program with 12 award categories, which includes the Gunnery Sergeant Carlos, Carlos N. Hatchcock II Award presented to an enlisted Marine who has made an outstanding contribution, contribution to the improvement of marksmanship training. A sniper range named for Hatchcock, is at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. In 1967, Hatchcock set the record for the longest sniper kill. He used an M2 50 caliber Browning machine gun mounted with a telescopic sight at a range of 2,500 yards or 2,286 meters, killing a Viet Cong gorilla. In 2002, sorry, I had to scratch my knees. In 2002, this record was broken by Canadian snipers Rob Furlong and Aaron Perry, from the 3rd Battalion of Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry during the war in Afghanistan. Hatchcock was one of several individuals to utilize the M2 Browning machine gun in the sniping role. This success led to the adoption of the, of the, of the 50 BMG cartridge as a viable sniper round. Springfield Armory designed a highly accurate accurized version of their M1A super match rifle with a Macmillan stock and match grade barrel and dubbed it the M25 White Feather. The rifle had a likeness of Hatchcock's signature and his White Feather logo marked on the receiver. Turner Sad Sadlery honored Hatchcock by producing a line of leather rifle slings based on his design. The slings are embossed with Hatchcock's signature. On March 9, 2007, the rifle and pistol complex at Marine Corps Air Station Miramar was officially renamed the Carlos Hatchcock Range Complex. Wow, you guys, there's a lot there. Uh, now let's go into the weaponry, okay? And this will be the end of it. We're going to go ahead and get that. Well, that and the fun facts will be the end. The weaponry, okay? Hatchcock generally used the standard sniper rifle, the Winchester Model 70, chambered for 30-06 Springfield cartridges. With the standard 8-power unertal scope, he also used the M40 Remington 700 chambered in 308 with a Redfield 3 to 9 times scope. On some occasions, however, he used a different weapon, the M2 Browning machine gun, on which he mounted an 8 times unertal scope using a bracket made by metal workers of the CBs. Hatchcock made a number of kills with this weapon in excess of 1,000 yards, including his record for the longest confirmed kill at 2,500 yards since surpassed. Hatchcock carried a Colt M1911A1 pistol as a sidearm. Now, fun facts. Let's go ahead and get through that. Now, the H2 documentary Sniper Inside the Crosshairs depicted a sniper team that successfully reenacted the through the scope shot, which which he, he did. That's the shot he did through that guy through the enemy scope. Uh, the 1993 film Sniper, starring Tom Berenger and Billy Zane, was loosely based on Hatchcock's first Vietnam tour. Scenes include the through-the-scope shot, as well as the assassination kill of the general. The 1998 movie Saving Private Ryan reproduced the through-the-scope shot against a German sniper. Now, we're going to go into the TV. The Mythbusters featured a test. Can a bullet travel through a sniper's scope and kill him? On their show, Hatchcock was mentioned in the NCIS episode One Shot, One Kill when a white feather was found at two crime scenes. Now, we also got Hatchcock's duel with Cobra was mentioned in the History Channel Sniper Inside the Crosshairs. Now, books. We're going to do the book. Author Stephen Hunter 
has on many occasions admitted that he took the inspiration for his series character, Bob Lee Swagger, from Hatchcock. Now, if you remember Bob Lee Swagger, that was that movie, The Shooter, with um, Mark Wahlberg. Okay? This is the, the author that wrote the book. All right? So I thought that was cool, fun, interesting facts that you'd like to know about him. They, I didn't, I wasn't able to pull any of the other ones. Like I, I did get some from uh, Hewitt Dunn, I think, but Jack Jack Hansen didn't. Have, there wasn't. I feel bad because there really wasn't much information on him. I mean, you got to figure the guy was young. He didn't really have a very long, very long career, um, you know. So that that kind of had a lot to do with that. But anyways, you guys, I hope you. I hope you enjoyed this and get to learn some more about some more badasses because that's that's absolutely what they were. And you know what? I thank them for their service. You know, they, they sacrificed a lot, you know, and and, and ultimately uh, the young man, Jack Hansen, he he paid the ultimate price. It's sad. It happens. It, it does happen a lot. And that's why I say we need to thank our veterans for their sacrifice. Thank them for what they do. All right? Well, you guys, that's it for Badasses Episode 2. All right? If you have any recommendations, any stories, anything that get you want to put you want to put in, send them to me on my email. It's uh, uh, thetradingpost8124 at gmail.com. Or you could just comment down below and say, you know, give me a comment about something you want me to do. Okay? i got a lot of other stuff lined up. We're going to do some more of these badass episodes. Um, and honestly, I want you to understand one thing, too. This this, this uh, series of episodes, badasses, it does not just pertain strictly to military personnel. Okay? There's going to be a lot of them thrown in there because there are a lot of badasses in the military. That's what they train for, you know? But we're going to do some civilian badasses as well, okay? So I hope you um, keep that in mind for future reference, you know. But I think this was, it was very interesting. I mean, my God, with that, with that Hewitt Dunn, they, you know, his, the squadron, they, they dropped 19,000 tons, not pounds, tons. That's a lot. I mean, I can't even fathom how much that, that is. Like, I couldn't even imagine. That's crazy. And he flew over a hundred, over a hundred missions. And I think the accurate count from one of the sources that I looked at was, I think they said it was like 104, 104 missions he flew. Correct me if I'm wrong, if, if any of you all know. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut this a little bit short, you guys. Have a good one, all right? I hope you stuck out. I hope you stuck in for this one because there was it was three amazing story, uh, three amazing life stories of these people. You know, um, my gratitude to them people and their sacrifices. Truly, you guys have a good one, and uh, we'll be back again. See you later. <laughs>